Okay, jolly good. So it looks like I'm recording, right? Yeah. Yes. There was a, a message saying this meeting is being recorded. Ah, I didn't get the message. <laughs> okay, so shall I start then? Yes, go ahead. Alex, so, the floor is yours. Super, thank you very much. So um, this is part two of the seminar that part one was um, two weeks ago. Uh, apparently, according to a summary that Andre posted on Slack while I was talking, I began two weeks ago with some philosophy. Um, I didn't realize I was doing that. I, I apologize for the um, accidental philosophy. Today, I will not repeat the philosophy, but um, I shall start with a little review of what we did last time from a technical point of view. Um, one issue last time that arose apparently was I changed notation from my notes while I was giving the talk and then I wasn't very consistent about adapting it. So this is something one should not do. However, in preparing this talk, I was um, writing my notes and uh, three quarters of the way through, I ran out of suitable letters of the alphabet. So I decided to change notation retrospectively on last week's talk and on the early parts of my notes. So I'm going to now review last week's with um, a slight change of notation, which is actually also different from the notation I have in my notes in front of me, because it's going to help me later. So please, if you spot any notational inconsistencies, please flag them, um, because I may make notational mistakes. Um, but what I'm going to recapitulate on is basically what the definition of atomic sheaves are and what our two um, main examples are. So, and here we have good notes apparently. So you see my pen moved, but nothing came. I actually think that maybe it's the sensitivity of my, of my pen that's set wrongly. Um, but Anyway, so the recap is for a small category C, we're going to consider pre-sheaves and then atomic sheaves, which are particular pre-sheaves that satisfy a further um, sheaf property. Um, so pre-sheaves form a category, which is just written C hat. And what a pre-sheaf is, is a functor from the opposite of C to sets. So the category of pre-sheaves is the functor category, which is written with these square brackets. So this is the category. So it really doesn't seem to want to write quite often, I don't. I don't know if this is good notes or, or if it's some problem with the, the knowing when I'm actually pressing the pen. Um, so that's the category of pre-sheaves. And um, to remind you what a pre-sheaf looks like, or rather the notation for it and the notation I'm going to use. Um, so. So if we're given a pre-sheaf F, because it's a functor. Um, and so here is my first change of notation. I'm going to use capital letters from the early part of the alphabet as objects of my indexing category C. but this is not in my notes. So given a morphism in C, then what a, then what a, a pre-sheaf gives us is that for any object, so for any element Y, sorry, X, and here, this is another change, notational change. I'm going to use capital letters for elements of pre-sheaves. So elements for the sets of pre-sheaves for any element X in the set that the pre-sheaf gives us over A. What the pre-sheaf gives us is a kind of action on morphisms of the category C. So we can apply the action to the element X 
So we can re-index, if you like, x along f, and we get an element of the pre-sheaf over the object b. So we have this contravariant action taking us from sets over a to, to the set over a to the set over b. And then we have the important notion of an atomic sheaf, which is which says that under certain conditions, we can go in the other direction. And the condition you will remember is rather technical and I'm not going to revise the, the technical part of the condition. I'm just going to remind you of what the, the name was. So, so it's an atomic sheaf if for any what I called F invariant, but the correct technical term in the sheaf literature would be matching. So for every F invariant, And this is a property of elements of the, of the set over B. So for any element Y in the pre-sheaf over the object B, an F invariant is somehow a way of saying that this element Y is impervious to distinctions made by the morphism F. Now, as I say, it was a technical condition, we went into it in great detail last time, so I'm not going to revise that. But if we have such an F invariant Y that, so an element that does not see the distinctions made by F, well then that Y, the, the sheaf property says that Y actually comes as the re-indexing under F of some X over A, and there's a unique such thing. So, so for any F invariant Y, there exists a unique F, X, Um, in, uh, in the set over A, such that Y is obtained by, from X by the action of F. So such that Y is X along F. And then I'm only going to, con so there, the notion of sheaf can be much more general than this for something called a growth and Dick topology. I'm only going to consider the special case of these atomic sheaves that are defined in this way that um, I gave the technical definition for last time. And I'm going, so I'm just going to write sh of C for the category, that's the full supper category. So this arrow means uh, full and faithful embedding. We're defining a full subcategory of pre-sheaves. So namely, we consider the full subcategory of those pre-sheaves, that is, um, those pre-sheaves that are atomic sheaves. So I'll just write this full subcategory of sheaves just to save on writing. And this definition, as I've defined it, makes sense for an arbitrary category C but it only has good properties for categories that enjoy a certain property, which was the co-confluence property. So in the case that the category C is what I call co-confluent, but Peter Johnson calls the left or a condition. So it's a very weak property on a category. So I will remind you what this means just with a picture. So it's saying that for any pair of morphisms in the category like that, we can complete them to a commutative square. So let's write that diagrammatically like that. Given to the pair of morphisms in the bottom right, there exists a completion to a commutative square. And as I said last week, this will always hold, of course, if the category has pullbacks, but it's much weaker than the category having pullbacks. So if C is co-confluent, then this category of sheaves is a growth and topos. You don't need to know what a growth and topos is. It just means that the category has very good properties and we'll see some of those properties later in this course, L not the course, um, later in this 
uh, in today's talk. So then it's a growth in dictopos. And the inclusion functor has a left adjoint. The inclusion. And don't worry too much about all the um, category theoretic terminology here because a lot of it's not going to be important. I just want to um, state it for the record. So the inclusion in C hat has a left adjoint, which is not only left adjoint, but it preserves finite limits. So it's a, a left exact left adjoint. And this is called the associated sheaf functor or sometimes the sheafification functor. And there are several ways of defining it, uh, many of which are very beautiful, but that is beyond today's talk. So the associated sheaf functor and we'll write sort of bold little a for that, which is quite a standard notation. So that functor takes us from a pre-sheaf. If it's a sheaf, it um, gives us back the same sheaf or at least an isomorphic sheaf. Um, but if it's not a sheaf, it can't somehow completes the pre-sheaf to a sheaf in a universal way. And one thing about a, the Atomic sheaves in this case. Um, so in this case, in the case of atomic sheaves, um, we also have another very nice property. So this does not hold in general for growth and dictoposes where one has much of the rest of the picture, but for atomic sheaves, there is a further nice property. Um, which is that the category of sheaves on C is what's called a Boolean topos. That means, so toposes have an internal logic and we'll see some of the internal, internal logic later in the talk. And being a Boolean topos means that boot that internal logic is classical. So we have a classical internal logic. Um, this only holds if we're working in a classical meta theory but uh, in my talk, we are working in a classical meta theory. And we'll see a bit later why we have um, classical logic. So we have a classical internal logic. Okay, so that's the general picture from last week about atomic sheaves. And then we had two main examples, one of which I actually forgot to do the main thing I wanted to do with, and that's the, the first one. So, the exa so example one, this is also from last week, um, is a topos that's very well known called the Chanuel topos. And here, the pre-sheaves we considered pre-sheaves over the category I opposited, where I is a small category equivalent to, to um, correct the little mistake last week, um, but I won't bother being writing that down where I is a small category equivalent to the category of injective functions between finite sets. And it's easy to show that I op is co-confluent. Uh, 
well, rather than working in IOP, of course, it's easier to work in I, the category of finite sets and injective functions. So showing I op is co-confluent is the same thing as showing that I is confluent. So just dualize the definition of co-confluent. So, so you have then, if you've got the top left of a square, then there exists the, um, the, exist the co-span in the bottom right that will complete it to a square. Um, so confluent is a property that any category with pushouts will have. I does not have pushouts. On the other hand, if you've got two injective functions between finite sets that form a, um, form a, a span, then you can take the pushout in the category of sets, and that pushout gives you the completing diagram in I. It just turns out it's not a pushout in I, but it is nonetheless a completing square in I. So I is co-confluent. So we have a topos of atomic sheaves and the, the topos of atomic sheaves over I op is the chanual topos. So that's what I forgot to tell you last week. It was mo a motivating part in my introduction, but I actually forgot to tell you what the, the chanual topos is. So it is, at least I think I did. So it is that. And for people who know about nominal sets, um, it's equivalent to the category of nominal sets. And that's a non-trivial equivalent. So the category of nominal sets is the category of continuous group actions over for the automorphism group on a countably infinite set. Um, so I don't want to go into that in more details, but nominal sets have a lot of, lot of people are interested in them in, them in computer, computer science. So actually there are two categories of nominal sets. Um, depending on what you take as morphisms, this is equivalent to the category of nominal sets where you take equivariant functions as morphisms. The other option for morphisms is um, finitely supported functions, as they're called. Um, but this is the, the main category of nominal sets. And in this case, we had an example of a sheaf, which I'm going to return to. And I'm going to use the same example. And I was calling that lamb. And I'm not going to, I'm just going to specify things by defining the action on objects. Of, so it's a sheaf, so it's a pre-sheaf, so it's a, a functor from the opposite of the category of finite sets and injections to set. So for every finite set gamma, we need to define a set, and then we need to define the action on morphisms. I did the action on morphisms last week, so I'm just going to remind you of the action on objects today. So for every for a finite set gamma, Lam is the set of untyped lambda terms. Where the reason for using the notation gamma is a finite set, but it acts like a context. Well, it's an untyped context, but still it's a context of variables. Um, so it's untyped lambda terms with free variables from gamma. And for good taste, let's quotient that by alpha equivalents. Uh, one doesn't need to, as long as one defines things appropriately, but it's not such an interesting object if you don't. Um, so the point is here, so with pre-sheaves in general and for and atomic sheaves, we have sets living indexed by objects of the category C. In this case, the indexing objects are finite sets and we're viewing those finite sets as kind of contexts of free variables. So that was example one. And example two. Was the category of probability sheaves.
Um, so this here we considered um, pre sheaves over S. So this is the pre sheaf case. This isn't yet probability sheaves, where S was a complicated category that I'm not going to. Um, I'm not going to again explain the definition like I did last week. Um, just tell you what it is. Which so S was the category of of nice sample spaces, measure preserving functions between nice sample spaces, and nice sample spaces meant a standard Borel probability space. So it's the category of measure preserving measurable functions, but let's not say measure measurable because to be measure preserving you have to be measurable in the first place. So so measure preserving functions between nice probability spaces, which means standard Borel probability spaces. I'll just write prob spaces. So remember a probability space has both a sigma algebra and a probability measure. And then once again, we have that the category S is co-confluent. So the category of sheaves is going to be a nice category. And this is not a triviality. There have been several papers written, not exactly with this result stated like this, but with where the, where the main theorem in the paper has essentially been equivalent to um, this category being co-confluent. And this is one of the reasons in order to get this that one needs a, a category of nice um, probability spaces. If one had arbitrary probability spaces, so measurable spaces with a probability measure, then one wouldn't have the co-confluence. One also wouldn't have a small category, but um, oh, sorry, again, it's a small category equivalent to um, so that's not a triviality. And if I had another part to the talk, I might spend a whole part of the talk explaining this, but it's mainly probability theory. Um, so why, why this works, or well, let's say measure theory on standard Borel from on standard Borel probability spaces. Um, so, so then, we have the gross and Dick topos, the atomic topos with, with a Boolean log internal logic is the category of probability sheet, is the category. So this is a nice category because of the co-confluence result. And we call this these, these pre-sheaves that are sheaves, we call them probability sheaves, probability sheaves. And again, we had an a main example. And in this case, it was useful last week to first consider an example pre-sheaf and then look at the sheaf associated with it. So an example pre-sheaf was random variables, which over a sample space omega was defined to be just the set of measurable functions from the sample space to the reals. So the usual definition of a random variable. So that should be pre sheaf with an F. Um, but that wasn't a sheaf. And the sheaf was, um, for the sheaf, I'm going to underline it to distinguish from the pre-sheaf. And the sheaf 
was, well, it was the measurable functions from omega to the reals. Quotiented by almost sure equality. And you may notice I've left some space here, and that's because I'm going to very slightly generalize this example in that I'm going to allow that we consider random variables that have other value spaces other than the reals. That's going to be useful for later in the talk. Everything that I said about the reals goes through. So the kind of nice spaces we're going to allow the values to take place from, the, take, the, the values to belong to are going to be, the reals are a standard Borel space, and we're going to allow the values to take, um, the random variables to take a value in any standard Borel space. So here I'm going to allow the values to take, the random variables to take a value in any standard Borel space, S a standard Borel space. So let's write SDD for standard, standard Borel space. And then we consider measurable functions from omega to S. Again, we have a, a sheaf so now the, the pre-sheaf is RVS. Given the standard Borel space, the pre-sheaf is RVS. And then we're saying what the action of that pre-sheaf is on every object of the indexing category. And again, the sheaf is RV, RV underline S and the action on the object of the, um, of the category. And we had the result for the reals, which generalizes also to um, the case of an arbitrary standard Borel space, um, which is that this sheaf where we identify up to almost sure equivalence actually arises from the pre-sheaf by converting it to a sheaf using the associated sheaf functor. And we, we had, so we had the result, I'll just write it down, I won't put any words around it. So we had the RV, the sheaf of S is actually, we can obtain it up to isomorphism by applying the associated sheaf functor to the pre-sheaf RV of S. Sorry, there's an S missing here. And that means that, that means that by wanting to view things as sheaves, we're forced to use almost sure equality as the equality between random variables. But then the fact that almost sure equality is actually equality between random variables in our model means we are then going to be able, as long as everything makes sense, as long as we can interpret probabilistic concepts in terms of sheaves, we are guaranteed to have the substitutivity properties um, that are associated with equality. So we can always intersubstitute almost surely equal random variables. Okay, so, those are the two examples, and that's the end of the review of last week. Um, so this is not strictly philosophy, what I'm about to do now, but it is motivation then for doing this in the first place and for what's going to come in the talk. And as I view it, there are essentially two different motivations for this picture. So we're going to consider one, one motivation for, for looking at this, which is essentially the motivation that was behind some notes that Terence Tao wrote in 2010 about some review of probability theory on, on a web page, um, on his blog. And um, in, that, in that review, he said that um, he wanted to look at probability theory from a sort of conceptual perspective. He was reviewing probability theory and he wanted to say what it means to be a probabilistically meaningful property of, about probability. And essentially you can read his article as saying probabilistically meaningful properties naturally relate to, naturally are properties about pre-sheaves rather than about sets of things. Um, so, with our sheaf theoretic perspective that we don't just want extension, but we also want restriction from last week. Um, one can extend that to that 
sheaves provide us with a, a lens for looking at probability theory through and that probabil probabilistically And one would hope that one can sort of assess the meaningfulness. So meaning, probabilistically meaningful concepts. So this is, let's actually call this a thesis. So probabilistically meaningful properties naturally organize themselves into sheaves, atomic sheaves. Oh, I won't write naturally, so organize themselves. So that can only be somehow justified by uh, looking at a lot of probabilistically meaningful properties and seeing that that's the case. But from our perspective already, it says something because um, if we believe this thesis, it sort of says ordinary equality, direct strict equality between random variables is not really, pro well, that does not form a sheaf, or does form a pre-sheaf, um, and perhaps that's not really a meaningful equality between random variables. Anyway, I don't want to go more along those lines. I can argue that at length in a different forum. Um, I just want to raise that as one perspective of looking at what we're doing. But here today, I'm going to look at the same thing from, I think, a more practical rather than conceptual perspective. So the thesis of this talk is rather, rather than the probabilistically meaningful properties organizing themselves into sheaves, it's to use the structure of sheaves to organize the probabilistic properties. And in particular, we're going to use things like the um, logic that sheaves have to talk about probability. So, so the thesis of this talk is that the Boolean logic of probability sheaves Um, provides an organizational tool for the concepts of probability theory. Um, so I'm just going to write that down with minimal words. So it provides an organizational tool for the, so really for the probability, for those concepts of probability theory that are probabilistically meaningful, but I'm just going to say an organizational tool or probability theory. And while on the motivation, just to say, in a sense, this is very comparable to the motivation, part of the motivation that's used for using nominal sets in computer science, where the internal logic of nominal sets is very useful for organizing um, organizing concepts related to bound and free variables and um, the preservation of alpha equivalents and this kind of um, this kind of uh, the, these, these kinds of issues. Um, now this talk's not only going to be about this one topic of probability this one collect one topos of probability sheaves. It's more generally going to be about atomic um, toposes in general. So it includes the Chanuel topos and includes the topos of probability sheaves. And what we're going to see in particular is that as well is that we have an internal logic and in the case of probability sheaves, the internal logic um, has equality as the internal logic of a topos always does. It always has an, an equality predicate, but for every object, it also has an equivalence predicate, which is a, a coarser relation than equality and which has interesting substitutivity properties, 
And if we look at those substitutivity properties in the case of probability theory, we can derive some results of probability theory. Okay, so, well, that's almost an hour reviewing last week, um, but uh, I think we've organized things in, in a way that sets the scene. And now really what I want to do is a little bit introduce the logic in an atomic topos. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say is going to be general to um, sheaf toposes um, in general, um, but some things will be specific to atomic toposes and I'll make, um, I'll, I'll try to explain that when we get to it. So, and I want to do logic with as little syntax as possible. So I don't need to in introduce the syntax and fix, to, fix it. And this was the thing that caused me the most headache in um, preparing this talk. And I don't know if I've actually struck a good balance or not. I find it very hard to know the best way to present these things. But the idea in general is we're interested, we're in some atomic, we've got some atomic topos that we're interested in its sheaves, and we want to express properties of those sheaves. So the properties So like predicates relating to, so product properties of a sheaf F of a sheaf F are simply subsheaves. So just like a property of a set you can view as a subset, namely the subset of elements that satisfy the property. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between predicates and subsets. Um, I don't know where that H came from. Oh yeah, oh yeah, because I'm not saying sets, I'm saying sheaves. Um, so subsets, so a sub a subsheaf we can write as a P for the property, a subsheaf of, so I'm using underlining to emphasize when I'm talking about pre-sheaves that are sheaves. But what is a subsheaf? Um, so a subsheaf, We can view it as, well, what would we expect to have in order to express a property of a sheaf F? So sheaves are like sets, except that we're indexing them by objects of our category C. So for every object of C, we have every object of the category C, we have a set F of C. And a property is just going to be singling out some elements of that set for every object. So it's just going to be a family indexed by objects of, sorry, let's make that an A, indexed by objects A of the category C of subsets, so for every object A, we have a subset PA, so it's just simply a subset of F of the set. That looks like an E, but it's an F underlined. Of the set that the sheaf assigns at A. So we simply have a family of such subsets, but for it to be a subsheaf, it needs to, res it needs to behave well with respect to the action of um, transferring elements from one set to another. So transferring elements along morphisms in C. So it's a family such that, so S dot T such that, two things hold. It's a sub pre-sheaf. So that's for all morphisms well, in fact we can we can put the for all morphisms outside because we're going to need it twice. So such that for all morphisms B from B to A, we have that if we have some element 
And in today's notation, I'm using capital X's for elements of, um, of sheaves and pre-sheaves. So if we have an element X belonging to, that's an element of F at the object A, that belongs to P at the object A. So we can simply say if X belongs to P at the object A, then if we re-index X along F, if we transfer X along F to an element of, we then get an element of F of B because the transfer operation takes place in F. We just have a family of subsets at the moment. We don't have a transfer operation on the P's at the moment, but this is going to give us one. So we transfer along X along F in C and we get back an object of the subset of, of, of the set, of the subset of F of B um, that, bit, that is given by P. So this says a sub pre-sheaf. So P is a sub pre-sheaf. And being a subsheaf says that, so this is, if we had an element satisfying the property in A, then we get a, an element satisfying the property in B. Being a subsheaf says, if we have an element in B that is F invariant, then the element down here that satisfies it. So if this satisfied P, then the element down here it came from also satisfies P. But actually, because of the sheaf property, we don't even need to refer to F invariants. Any F invariant element will be the um, will have been obtained from an element over A under the action of F. So all we need to say is any element in F of B that arises as um, in the pre-sheaf capital F of B that arises from an element in A, if that belongs to P, then the origin then the element over A also also satisfies P. So in other words, so, so we can say that as if we have any X belonging now to F of A and, and when we transfer it along F, we get an element of, that sati of F of B that satisfies P, then X itself satisfies P at A. So it might be helpful just to have a little picture here. So we have a morphism F from, from B to A. We've got the pre-sheaf or the, the sheaf which gives us a set F of A. And here we have a set F of B. Sorry, again, that looks like an E, but it's an, it's an underlined F. I shall try to be a bit more careful. And then we have the composing, we have the transfer along F, which is a map from the set here to the, the set here. And within these sets, we have those elements that satisfy P. So those are the, let's put them in a red bubble. And we have those elements that satisfy P at B. And the first property simply says, if we have an element here in the red bubble, then it gets mapped to an element at the top in the red bubble. And the second property, well, it's equivalent to, we've got a classical meta theory to saying, if we have an element at downstairs that's outside the red bubble, then it again gets mapped to somewhere outside the red bubble. So in this way, the properties we have when our sub pre sheaves the properties we have are very strongly preserved by the um, the, re the transfer of elements in that the, both the property and its negation is preserved and that is the essential reason that 
we're going to have classical logic holding in our topos when we come a little bit more to the logic. Um, okay, so, so then it is clear once we've got this how we get a, a pre-sheaf action on the sets P because we inherit it from the from, from F. And that pre-sheaf, if it satisfies the second condition, it's automatically a sheaf. So this says that P is a subsheaf. Okay, well, I, I fear I haven't got very far. Um, maybe, so it's kind of time for, for a break, but maybe I'm going to just give one more slide to think about because it's another general slide and um, well not a slide another general page and there's not very much in it but it I think it will leave us at an appropriate point to to, to have a pause for thought. Um, so I want to give you one general example of a sub pre-sheaf but, be, but before that we need to consider product sheaves. So if f and G are sheaves, or if they're pre-sheaves, the same construction works for pre-sheaves, but the point is it preserves sheaves, then so is the product sheaf. And this is defined in exactly the way you would expect. So the product sheaf at an object A of the category C so we need to define the set at A. Well, it's simply the product of the set given by F of A and the set given by G at A. So, so products, you simply, for every indexing object, you product the sets locally, as one would expect. An example of a sub presheaf is the diagonal sub presheaf which is going to be our interpretation of the equality predicate. Um, so the diagonal the diagonal subsets, which I'm going to write as of the product of a sheaf with itself. So then we've We've got pairs of elements from F of A and F of A, so we can look at the diagonal elements. So I'm going to use equals sub F for that. And at an object A of the category C, this is, so this is defined to be equal to, this is simply defined to be equal to the, the diagonal elements. So that, so pairs of X paired with itself where X belongs to F of A. And an exercise for the break to get you familiar with the notion is that this gives a sub gives a subsheaf of F times F. So this is going to be the equality predicate for the sheaf F in the logic of sheaves that we're going to look at um, when, our, when we've had a little break. Um, so we could just simply write that as equality of F is a subsheaf, which I'll just use a subset relation for that of F times F. Okay, so that's a good point for a break. It's seven minutes past 11, according to my clock. Um, how about if we resume at quarter past, does that work? Yeah, okay, good. So let's um let's have a break. Are there any questions, by the way? Maybe we can stop the recording for the break or pause it. Okay. Right. So um after the break, so we, what we've had so far is the notion of um a property being given by a subsheaf and a particular property that's always available for any sheaf f is the property of equality on that sheaf which is of course a, a subsheaf 
equality for that sheaf, which is of course a sub sheaf of f times f, as one would expect. So, um, so equality is a straightforward notion in in sheaves, and um, and uh, we all, always have it by the by the expected definition. So now I want to just that's the general situation for um, any category of atomic sheaves or, or even arbitrary sheaves in, in, in that case. I now wanted to show some other interesting properties that exist in the um, example topos of the probability sheaves. So, so example of interesting properties, but I'll just write properties in the topos of probability sheaves. So sheaves over the our category of nice sample spaces. Um, well, we can start with equality, even though we've already seen it. But why do I want to consider it in in this case in particular, well, because I want to look at just, to, I mean, it's kind of clear in what we've done, but I, just to hammer it home, I want to look at the equality predicate for the sheaf of random variables that takes its value, that's notation from my notes, but it should be S, that takes its value in a standard, but that take their random variables that take their values in the standard Borel space S could be the reals. Um, so that's, of course, that's the equality predicate on, on the sheaf of random variables that takes its value in the standard Borel space S. And I want to highlight this because we have that a random variable X is equal in RV S to a random variable Y at a sample space omega. So this notation means we're looking at X and Y are elements of the random variable sheaves um, at, the, at the sample space omega. So in other words, they are measurable functions from omega to S, quotiented modulo almost or sure equality. So of course this holds if and only if, by the definition of the random variable S sheaf, this holds if and only if X and Y are almost surely equal as random variables. So equality in sheaves in the internal logic coincides with almost sure equality of random variables, essentially because our sheaf makes that identification. So that's one interesting relation in that in that category of sheaves. Another interesting predicate is independence, which I'll write using the standard not notation here. So this is independence. I won't bother to type it, um, but this is a typed relation and independence makes sense. It's a sort of heterogeneous relation. It makes sense between random variables valued in the space S and random variables valued in, could be the same space, but independence can also be for random variables valued in different spaces. So here it makes sense between arbitrary sheaves of random variables. And this is, so now at a sample space omega, two random variables at sample space omega are in this sheaf. So this is a set of pairs at omega, um, a random variable from omega to S and a random variable from omega to T. And it's simply the set of pairs defined by X and Y are in, are in the independence relation, if and only if, as you'd expect, X and Y, they're both over the same sample space. So X and Y are independent.
And that indeed defines a subsheaf. I'm not going to prove it, um, but it does define a subsheaf. Um, and just to say, I'm not going to go in this direction because I don't want to go too much into probability theory. This also generalizes to conditional independence. Then we can have X is independent from Y conditional on another random variable Z. So we also have a subsheaf for conditional independence. But as you will know, if you've done any probability theory at all, independence is a independence. Independence is a key notion. And thirdly, one of the main concepts I want to talk about, which has taken me a while to get round to, but I want to talk about it in generality, not just in specific, specificity, specificity, uh, uh, anyway. So we're going to actually see that it arises in general in an atomic topos, but the probability theory notion here is equality in law or equality in distribution, um, as it's also called. So this is, I'm going to, so let, I'm going to again change notation from my notes let me put equal superscript D. Well, D above the equals line, this is what the notation people often use for equality in distribution, which is the same thing as equality in law. So again, this only makes sense like equality if you've got for pairs of random variables valued in the same value space. So for example, for pairs of real random variables or for pairs of um, complex random variables or what have you, but they need to be valued in the same sample space. And this is defined by a random variable is in this relation to another random variable X and Y are in the, are in the equality in distribution or equality in law relation at omega, if and only if X and Y induce the same probability law on the value space S. So the law, that's the probability measure induced by X, um, that's the push forward of the probability measure from the sample space. So whenever you have a random variable, it gives you a probability measure on the result space. Um, that's, we call that the probability measure or law or distribution induced by X. So X and Y induce the same probability measure on X. And again, this one can prove it and I'm not going to, but it's not difficult. The, the same probability measure on S, one can prove that this is again a subsheaf of the product sheaf. So these are, so just to show that probabilistically meaningful properties do indeed fall within the world of subsheaves, but also we're going to see some nice examples of principles that involve these properties. But in order to do that, we need to go back to generality, um, to the general case. And what I want to do is to talk about the, the classical internal logic of sheaves over of atomic sheaves for a category C, where we assume we have the co-confluence property. So it is indeed um, a, a nice growth and dick topos. Um, so because it's a classical logic, fortunately, I don't need to tell you how many connectives are defined. We can define everything from conjunction, negation, and uh, we're going to use some quantification. So I'm going to focus on existential quantification. Um, so suppose we've got two different predicates. So a predicate is a subsheaf of, of, a, of a sheaf F. So suppose we've got two different predicates that are both subsheaves of the sheaf F. Then we define the conjunction
which is a, again going to be a subsheaf of the sheaf F in the expected way that X satisfies the, belongs to the, so this is an X in F of, F of a, at, a, at, an, at an object in the category C, let's say A. So X belongs to the, the subset of F defined by P and Q at the, of the set F of A. X belongs to that set as one would expect if and only if X belongs to the set defined, the subset defined by P and X belongs to the subset defined by Q. So the expected definition of conjunction. Um, and again, this is a subsheaf. So this, this defines a subsheaf. I won't write that down. It's just implicit. If I don't, if I say, if I don't say things are not subsheaves, then they, they are subsheaves. Um, we can also define the complement of P, which I'll just call not P, which is again going to be a subset of F. And again, this is going to be defined in exactly the way one would like it to be defined locally, that an X belongs to the complement of P, the set defined as the complement of P at A. So again, it's going to be a subset of F of, F of A, and it's simply the subset of all those X belonging to F at A that such that X does not belong. So all those elements that don't belong to the subset defined by P at A. And this, so in general, this wouldn't work for pre-sheaves or sheaves if one weren't considering atomic sheaves. It works for atomic sheaves because we had, when we were looking at what the sheaf property of being a sub sheaf, as I said, it preserves being inside the bubble of a subset and it also preserves being outside the bubble of a subset. And it's because of that second property that we can make this definition. So we crucially need the fact that P is a sub sheaf of F. In order, in order for this definition to give us even a, a even a pre-sheaf, and then it turns out to be a sheaf. So this is why classical logic works because everything the Boolean connectives can be defined locally, as long as we've got classical logic in the meta theory. And the last thing to do is existential quantification. So here is where I struggled with how to minimize notation, um, but for this. What we want to do, if, if we're given a P, a subsheaf of a product sheaf, F times G, what I want to do is define the, so this is a property of um, pairs, an X belonging to F and a Y belonging to G. I want to define the um, subsheaf of F of those X that correspond to their existing a Y such that X, Y together satisfy um, satisfy the property P. So, so given this, we're going to define and the notation I'm going to use is there exists a Y. So this is why I wanted to keep the little variables out till now. So there exists a Y in G such that P of little x Y. So I'm kind of using a an implicit X sort of that's typed over F. But it's just a notation. So uh, I might say more about this later, but this is actually an instance of the existential quantification in regular categories that Jure Taslak um, defined in his talk a few weeks ago. And maybe he was, he even introduced the notation exists along pi. Uh, so this, maybe he introduced the notation exists along pi one. I'm not sure if he did, but the a, a sort of variable way, variable free way of state of formulating this would be exists along pi one of P along the first projection that is. Um, but this is a sort of intuitive way of reading it. We want to say the property of F. So we're defining a subsheaf of F of those X 
for which there exists a y such that x and y together satisfy p. And this is defined by, um, so we want to say that an element x of f at, at, at object A of the category C. So x belongs to this existence. So it satisfies this existential statement for P, X, Y. It satisfies this existential statement at the object A, if and only if. And now we want to say there exists an element Y of G. Uh, sorry, this should be Y here. There exists an element Y of G such that X and Y together satisfy P. But what's the important and non-trivial thing that happens with the atomic topology here is that this existential is not local. Remember, we're thinking of maps from a B into A in the, in the indexing category C as allowing us to extend the realm of discourse from um, the from the values at A to potentially a richer set of values at B. And we allow our Y to potentially come from a richer set of values at a different object. So we're going to say that this holds if and only if there exists an object B in the category C and a, more, and a transition map from B into the object A, such that then the pair x, oh, sorry. And then there exists, and the point of that is to take us into a larger realm of discourse over B. So we're looking at F, we're going to look at G over B and allow our Y to come from G over B. Um, so, and there exists then, and there exists a, an element Y in G over B. such that together X and Y, well, are going to satisfy P, but because Y comes from B, we need to satisfy P at B. But X comes from A, so in order to get X and Y together over B, we need to transfer X along F. So we need to transfer X along F and, and take that together with Y, and that needs to belong to P at the object B. And uh, another way of doing that is to consider the projection from P into F times G along the, the, compose that with the first projection along F and take an image factorization as in Yure's talk. Um, and that would give in the category of sheaves and that would give exactly that definition. So as I say, it's an instance of the regular logic the existential quantification and the regular logic um, introduced in Yuri, Ta Yuri Taslak's talk. Um, and the interesting thing in atomic sheaves is that these three operations together, so it's kind of obvious for um, negation and conjunction just as they're defined, but also together with existential quantification, which is defined in the less trivial way, this non-local way, that these satisfy the laws of classical logic as long as our meta theory is classical. So these satisfy. And one can make precise sense of that, but that would be a whole series of talks in itself. Right, so I'll see if I've got time to do what I was planning to do. I mean, I do want to get to the general notion of equivalence, um, but still I want us to exercise ourselves with the logic a little bit using the concepts we've defined. Um, so using the quantifiers we've got, the, the connectives we've got, and um, using, the, using the concepts we've defined for probability sheaves. So I want to give you an example of an interesting logically valid principle 
in probability sheaves. So an interesting logical principle And um, for those who've been to previous talks by me on synthetic, what I call synthetic probability theory, um, this will be familiar. Um, so the logical principle is going to define um, a, it's going to state a property of random variables X belonging to random variables over some sample space S and y belonging to random variables over some sample space t. And so I'm going to consider a sort of context in which we've got an x and a y um, belonging to random variables valued in s and random variables valued in t. And then what appears on the right is going to is a, is a formula defined using the logical principles we've had before that will define a sub sheaf of the product chief random variables in S times random variables in T. So it's going to define a property of such pairs of random variables. And that formula is that, and this is going to be true, which means it will hold for all random variable, pairs of random variables X and Y. So it holds for all X and Y in that sheaf. So it's going to be the subsheaf it defines is the um, full subsheaf of all pairs. And the property says for any X and Y, random variables, there is ex exists an X prime, which is also a random variable over S, such that X prime has the same distribution as X and we can make X prime independent from Y. So whenever you've got a pair of random variables, you can always find a, another random variable equidistributed to the first that's independent from the second. So the first and second might be correlated, they might not, in which case you're already, if they're independent already, you're, you're done. But in any case, you can find a copy of X with the same, a different random variable with the same distribution that's independent of Y. So, so to prove this, I'm going to give a little, um, this is true. because, so we're given, so I'm going to sort of just argue in pictures. So we're given random variables X from some sample space. So we want to see that any X and Y over the same sample space. So X goes to S and Y goes to T. So these are random variables. Really, we have equivalence classes, modulo almost sure equality, but let's not worry ourselves about that. So these are random Vs, um, random variables. Um, so let's draw it in a picture. We have omega and we have X and Y So, so here, here this is the, the maps here are just measurable functions into, and let's put them the right way around, into the resulting value spaces. And we want, and there exists, we want to find another random variable X prime that's equally distributed to X, um, but independent of Y. Now the sample space omega might not have enough space in it to find such an independent X. This is one of the problems in probability theory. So what do probability theorists do? Well, they extend the space omega um, by creating another copy of omega, taking the product measure on it, and we're extending the space because we've got the marginal map, so the first projection here that goes from the product measure down to here. 
And on this space here, this larger space, we've got two copies of omega. We perf we're performing the probability, um, the, 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 the sampling given by the probability measure on omega twice and independently. And we still have X and Y here because we have the original, um, we have X along pi one. That's X, that goes to S. And we have Y along pi one, that goes to T. But also here, we can take X along pi two as another map to S. And that gives us a, it's, it's X again. And the probability measure on omega is the same as the, the, up here. It's twice the same measure as it was down here. So this again has the same distribution as X along pi one, but it's independent because we're using the product probability measure. So, so we're defining X prime to be this, so we've got the, origi the original x and y gets tran get transferred up along pi one, but here we have another random variable that's got by composing x with, with pi two, and that gives us our independent measure. So in probability theory textbooks, there's a little lemma to this effect sometimes that you can extend the sample space to find independent random variables. So Kallenberg's book does this sort of thing very nicely and systematically. And there's some extension lemma or something that explicitly says one can extend random variable the sample space such that this is the case. The point is the um, the logic of probability sheaves of the of the topos deals with this very naturally because we say exactly what we want to say, which is we don't want to worry about the sample spaces. The logic just says we can find an independent random variable with the right distribution. So the logic I think is a nice gives us a a nice way of compactly expressing properties. And here, this is, you know, this, this explains how the existential quantification somehow relates to the extension of the sample space, given the definition before. Um, so actually, maybe I'm not, so the next thing I wanted to do, but I think I better cut to my main theme. So the next thing I wanted to do is show you that there's actually an equivalent logical principle in the Chanuel topos. And if we place random variables here with lambda terms, I'll just tell you what it says. The equivalent, the equivalent principle in the Chanuel topos says for any pair of lambda terms, we can find another X and Y, let's say, we can find another lambda term X prime that is a renaming of X by renaming the free variables in X and such that X prime has no free variables in common with y. So this independence in the Chanuel topos also has a meaning and it's separatedness as it's called there. It's saying, so independence gets translated into the lambda terms x prime and y have no free variables in common. And the equality in distribution also has an analog in lambda terms and the, and the analog of equality in distribution, sorry, in the Chanuel topos, and the analog of equality in distribution is that one lambda term can be um, renamed to another lambda term by a renaming of its, bound, of its free variables. Okay, but I won't write that down to save time. Can I ask something about that? Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Um, so uh, because you uh, had lambda terms up to alpha equivalence, I'm not sure what it means to say that two lambda terms don't have variables in, in common. No, I'm talking about the free variables. Yes, but didn't you say it was up to alpha equivalence? So I can rename yeah, the, the alpha equivalence is on the, the alpha equivalence is on the bound variables. Uh, ah, okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah. yeah, so the free variables have their own identity, right? Yeah, thanks for the question. Alex, uh, these are probability spaces, right? I mean, uh, uh, measure, the total measure is one. Omega is a probability space. Omega is a pro okay. So that, that's why pi one is measure preserving. That's why pi one is measure preserving. Okay. Exactly. Thank yeah. you. Indeed. Yeah, the category of is the category of sample spaces and they are probability spaces. Yeah, thanks. Indeed, if they were 
other more general measure spaces, it would not be measure preserving. Um, right, so as I say, there's an analog of what we had previously um, also in the Chanuel topos, and that is because both independence and equality in distribution actually are instances of more logically general um, principles. Independence does not make sense in an arbitrary hadomic topos. It requires some, there's some subtlety in interpreting that in general, and that's the topic of other talks. But equality, the analog of equality and distribution is a general notion of equivalence that makes sense for atomic sheaves and has a very interesting principle associated with it. So this is now the main topic of the talk that we're finally getting to with about 12 minutes left. Um, and this is the, and it's actually very simple in general. So I'm going to call the relation twiddles. And so we're now back to the case that, we, that we've got any category C with the, the, the co-confluence condition and we're looking at the associated category of, of atomic sheaves. Um, and for any atomic sheaf F, I'll just write for any sheaf, we define a subsheaf twiddles of F, which is an intrinsic equivalence relation, just like equality is an intrinsic equivalence relation. And again, it's going to be a subsheaf of F times, well, it's an equivalence relation. So of course it's a subsheaf of, um, of, the, of the sheaf with respect to itself by, and the definition is we need now need to say when an element X of F of the set F of A, is related to an element Y of the set F of A. So this holds at an object A of C, if and only if, and the definition is very, very simple. It is that there exists an object B and a map from B to A in C such that if we transport, oh, sorry, we need two maps. Let's call them, actually, I'm going to rename this X prime. They need two maps, F and F prime from B to A such that if we transport X along F, we get the same thing. So we can bring X and X, we can bring X and X prime together. We transport X along F, we get X prime, and, and we transport X prime along F prime, we can bring them together. And actually, whenever a category satisfies the co-confluent property, this defines a sub presheaf of the um, of the presheaf F times F. But in the case that we've got a sheaf for the atomic topology, it turns out that this also defines a sheaf for a sub sheaf for the atomic topology. Um, so let's, so I don't want to go, I mean, that's just the definition. We have a way of bringing X and X prime together. And um, let me explain it by showing you that in, oh, I need a new page. There we are. By showing you that in,
in probability sheaves. This new relation dwindles for the random variables over some standard Borel space S coincides with coincides. Well, let's just say is equality in distribution. Um, and that is by the following statement. So that, let me So the following are equivalent for a pair of random variables x and x prime from a sample space omega to a value space s. So the first one is x and x prime are equal in law or in distribution. And the second one is the definition of twiddles, which in this case is there exists a sample space omega prime and maps P and P prime in our category of sample spaces from omega prime to omega, such that X along P equals X prime along P prime, almost surely because we're doing everything up to almost sure equality. And although I don't have much time, just to give you a flavor for it, I'm just going to sketch the proof of the one implies two direction, which is the more interesting one. So it's quite an easy result, this, but the, the interesting direction is one implies two. So suppose, suppose X and X prime are equal in distribution. So in that case, we can consider we can we can consider omega and we can consider x is a random variable to is, is a measure preserving function to s but s is a standard borel space we can put the probability measure mu on s which is induced by the random variable x so the push forwards of the probability measure here and likewise, we can consider the map from omega to S given by X prime. And we can also, we can make that measure preserving by putting a probability measure on it, which is the induced probability measure. So then we, so because they're equal in distribution, it's the same probability measure. So we have the same object of the um, category S. So then we, so because they're equal in distribution, then we get a diagram So we get a co-cone, which this is this kind of thing, sorry, not a co-cone, a co-span, this kind of two maps going to the same object are called a co-span. Um, so by co by co-confluence, so the, so the point is we've created, we've used the random variables, but this was a standard Borel space. We've got a probability measure it on it. So we get into, so, th so this is now a diagram in our category of sample spaces. So by co-confluence, we get P prime and P and omega prime that makes this diagram commute. I should have probably put dotted arrows here. And because this diagram commutes, we get exactly this that we wanted, okay? So it's a very simple argument, um, but uh, that's, it's that the equality in law allows us to convert the random variable into a co-span in the category of sample spaces. And what does this general 
property give us, the fact that we've got this, um, that, that it corresponds to this equivalence is that we can then make use of the following in general for, for, for atomic sheaves, the relation enjoys a very important invariance property. in the logic of in the logic of atomic sheaves over a category c with the co-confluence property and the invariance property is for any any sheaf f and subsheaf P we have the the principle that for all X and X prime in F If X is equivalent under this general equivalence relation to X prime, then P holds for X if and only if P holds for X prime. So there's a general intersubstitutivity property that makes it look like this relation should be equality but it's not equality because being a subsheaf here, this is externally in the category, we have an actual subsheaf of an actual given sheaf F. And logically what that means, I haven't been systematic about the going into the syntax of logic. Logically what, we, what that means is the properties can be expressed by formulas, but this formula can only have the one free variable X from the sheaf F. It can't have free variables from other objects in it. So for definable subsheaves, we have this property, but for general, general formulas in the open formulas in a context, we don't have this property. And that's what distinguishes. Um, so so this, is the, this is the invariance property. Um, whoops, let's put a box around it. So it's 12 o'clock. Um, I don't really want to overrun. So I, all I want to do is just, so I had quite a bit more. On, Alex, on, we're yeah. not, we're, so there's a bunch of us who are not going to lunch before before 12.30 because we're waiting for Katya to finish her class. Uh -huh. So I think if you go on a little more, there's no problem. Well, I think an appropriate thing to do is just to state the probability result I was going to derive from this. Okay, I mean, it's up to you, it's as you wish. Yeah. Well, well, I shall state it and then, and then we can maybe disconnect the recording and we can have a, oh, I, I don't know. Um, so, so, so I wanted to go to an application of this. And that for that property, it's very important that, that P is a sub sheaf, not a sub pre sheaf. Um, so application in the probability sheaves category. Um, so in Kallenberg's book for probability theory, there's, um, he systematically does what, does a sequence of results that I sort of 
call the infrastructure of probability theory and that they're about how to take random variables and transport them to other sample spaces by extending the sample space. So just like we did earlier in the little result we, we looked at about there always exists an independent random variable that was by extending the sample space. Um, and another similar result he has is something he calls the transfer, the, 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 um, the transfer theorem. I don't know how general that terminology is. And again, that to, to state that properly, um, that it involves extending sample spaces, but I'm just going to state it as a logical, as a more compact logical principle using our, our logic. So, so let's just say, compare Kallenberg's book on foundations of probability theory. It might probably exists in other books too, but Kallenberg is very, very systematic about this. So, so our internal statement is that is the following logical principle, whoops. For all um, X and X prime random variables over a sample over a value space S and Y a random variable. So again, it's about finding another another copy of x prime, y over y, which is a random variable over a sample space t. Um, so what it says is that if x is equal in distribution to x prime, then we can find a copy of y prime such that X prime and Y prime together have the same joint distribution as X and Y together. So there, so there exists a Y prime that's also, and there's another random variable over T such that the random variable X comma Y obtained by producting the two random, by, two, by pairing the random variables X and Y and using the fact that the random variable is a function that preserves products from um, standard Borel spaces to sheaves, so that um, so so that we have we can find a, a copy of y prime such that x prime and y prime enjoy the same distribution as x and y, the same joint distribution as x and y, and this can be derived from the transfer property we had. Um, on the previous slide using the fact that it's not completely immediate, but uh, it takes a bit of manipulation, but using the fact that equal in equality in distribution is this general equivalence relation. Anyway, if anyone's interested in the details, I think we should take that offline. Um, I'm, again, I went more slowly than I was expecting, but um, it sort of felt right to be slow and my tablet doesn't let me go that fast anyway. So, um, so that's it. And uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to happy to answer them or try. So thank you. I have a question. Yep. Um, when you defined the uh, what was it um, the the tilde the one that says that uh, there the two things are equal. Yeah. Uh, if there exists a transfer somewhere where that makes them equal. Yeah, that's the equivalent. So, the, is can you can, yeah can you uh, can you decompose this into a model operator and then it's just some model operator applied to equality? Oh, I mean, it certainly has a flavor of modality because of this, like like this um this invariance principle, the conditions that it that it, that there should be no free variables in there. It feels very modal, but I haven't thought about that at all. So. Uh, or maybe I have. So, so I think, that, yeah, there is. Um, so actually, yes, the one can. I mean, the, one can quotient by this equivalence relation, and it is just equality under the quotient. In the in the so, you, so in a sense, that's kind of an answer to the question, I guess. Well, now you know that the model operator is there. Um, 
And then the question would be probably if you can you can you can see this model if this model operator also appears in some other maybe in some other form that is more shifty. Um, so I have another question. So what what's probably going to be so in order for this logic to uh, allow you to prove interesting things, the crucial question always going is going to be the following: If you define some concept semantically by referring to the structure of the sheaf. And then you in, and, and then you import that concept into the logic. The question then immediately becomes: How good a handle do you have on the concept in logic? So, you know, the best option is if it's just internally definable, then you kind of know everything. But yeah. often that's not going to be the case. So, do you have a feel for which of these concepts, like independence and 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 uh, well, equivalence and so on, um, how how much can you do? I mean, like, how how much uh, how specific is lo the logic about them? That is to say, you know, this relation maybe, uh, you know, can you do? Do you, does the logic know more than that? Just that this is an equivalence relation. Can can you? Well, it does in the sense that it knows this invariance property. But okay, so that's a very strong one. That one will probably let you prove a lot of things, right? So maybe here's another way to ask. Um, a lot of these things you can do in general for atomic topology. At what at, is there a point at which uh, the the probability, the, the specific case of probability, uh, departs from anything general about atomic logic? Um, well, so the equivalence relation makes sense for the general atomic top topology. Independence makes sense less generally but still in some generality huh? um but then as soon as one wants to do anything interesting about probability theory you need to include the map from random variables to probability measures which give their laws and that's kind of the axiomatic basis on which i do the the synthetic probability right, theory right. That, that, that i've talked about but that, which is which is taking place in this topos defined over a category of sets in which all in which which satisfies that all sets of reals are measurable um so that so that uses this topos construction in the non-standard category category of sets um but but backing away from like particularly probability theory though i mean there does seem to be a lot of structure here that's kind of common to a few examples. So in particular, the nominal sets versus there are a lot of overlaps between nominal sets in this um, this probability setting and also some other related categories that people have looked at as well. So that so that seems so the, the kind of the question of what to take as basics as sort of basic axiomatic material and build on. I, I think that's a very interesting question. and. Um, just one more question for me uh is the real numbers object what it's supposed to be or is it the wrong one so what well the real numbers object is just the discrete sheaf of reals oh discrete so it's not random variables in the reals uh -huh, okay real but that's good because i mean you know a real a real number is not a random thing. So one yeah, one, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. One yeah one agreed, agreed. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. yes. Um, uh, okay. But just going back to your first question, so I mean, I'm not sure about the, the modal operator side, but I mean, there's this equivalence relation is somehow has very strong connections with the logic of atomic sheaves. So, so one way of looking at it, if in case you know this, so atomic sheaves are exactly those growth and toposes in which the um, the lattices of subsheaves of a sheaf are complete atomic Boolean algebras. Okay. So that's where the atomic comes from. And this equivalence relation is saying that the elements X and Y reside in the same inside the same atom of the Boolean algebra. Okay. Um, of the so uh, so that's somehow how it arises. Good. So thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay. So, I have a question, if I can ask. Yeah, um, yeah. When you defined the existential operation uh, in the in the logic part, yeah. Um, so I was kind of wondering what's the reasoning behind this um, 
definition because you have this morphism in there. And um, can you maybe explain where this comes from? Okay. Why do you... There are a number of ways of, of trying this. So, um, so one, one answer is it comes from the general interpretation of logic in growth and ictoposes in which the basic notion in your, in your underlying categories, you, you have a notion of a set of morphisms in your underlying category C, um, a set of morphisms into an object A covering that object. So for example, if, you're, if you have the category of open, of the partial order of open subsets of a topological space, then you can, a set of morphisms into an open subset would be sort of a collection of, of, um, of open subsets of the given open subset. And the covering property would say that this collection covers the open subset on the right. So you have a notion of a general collection of morphisms into an object covering. And the general notion of existential quantification says for something to exist, it's enough to show that it exists on every, every, every object that's participating in a cover. Um, but maybe that's not very intuitive. Um, but but it's, it's just an in, it's a restriction of that general notion. So that maybe more intuitive in this case is that we're viewing our pre-sheaves as sets indexed by the objects of C. So um, or, or our sheaves rather set in. So we have a set over A and a set over B, and we want to. And um, we're allowing ourselves to extend the realm of discourse from A to B by extending, say, the sample space or extending the context of free variables in which we have a lambda term. And we some, the idea here is, in a sense, the existential quantification is trying to be global rather than local. We want to say there exists some object in our universe that satisfies the property. And to get it, we might need to expand our vision from our current narrow vision that's dictated by A. We allow ourselves to expand our vision of what we might have to encompass potential other things. And you know, we, we need to give ourselves enough context to be able to, um, so, so it's a sort of nice global existential quantification. And it just then has the right, if one tried to make the existential quantification local, um, you would not get even a pre-sheath back in this case. Oh no, you would no, you would get a pre-sheaf, but you wouldn't get a sheaf. Hang on. Well, anyway, something would fail. I can't work it out in my head what would fail. Um, okay. Yeah. Thanks for that explanation. Yeah. Yeah. In a sense, it's the it's the beauty of the machinery that um, you know the whole the whole power of I mean basically the main power of this logic is coming from this non-local existential quantification. And so when, when one looks at these examples in probability theory, so if you look in Kallenberg's book, the analogous uh, extension result has, well, from the sample space omega, we can extend the sample space to an omega prime and find, a, find an X prime there, such that all this holds where you need to transfer the X and the Y as we did in the proof. And it's, it's rather nice to just be able to state it in the compact form where you don't need to worry about what, what your sample space is. Good. Yeah, thanks. Are we done? We're probably done for today. Thank you very much, Alex. Yeah, and if I were there, I would choose burgers, but- Okay. Um, but uh, I'm not, but I look forward to being there sometime in the future and- uh, Soon, soon. Yes, hopefully, yeah. Have, have other people heard their second um, vaccination date? Yeah, ask Anya on what date she got hers. Was it your wedding day? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got mine on the same day, probably, then. <laughs> you didn't hear I, yet? No, no, I, I got it uh, yesterday. Yeah. So, yeah. They're, how strict are they not be, about not being able to move the... Well, I, I just cancelled my, my vaccination appointment in the in the yeah. form they provide it on the web page. And now I'm, I don't know, I'm waiting for, to hear so from them. We're veering off the seminar. I'm stopping the recording, by the way. Oh, yeah. oh, that, it wasn't already stopped. No.
Oh. How it's going to be? 